Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining our second Austin-focused National Drive Electric Week session. I am Aaron Choate, the coordinator of Austin EV, the Austin chapter of the Electric Auto Association. And tonight, we're going to be talking with Mark Davis with Moment Motors about doing custom electric car conversions. Mark has put together a talk and will give us a virtual tour to get us started, and then we'll open the floor up to questions from you. If you want to enter your questions in the chat window as you go, feel free. Um, I might be able to pull them out and, and ask Mark questions as, as he starts. But then um, once we get into the real question and answer session, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them live yourself. And with that, Mark, will you go ahead and get started? Great. Thanks, uh, y'all, for coming. Uh, look, I've been looking forward to this. So, uh, yeah. Um, We'll just start with a kind of a, giving you my background and talk a little bit about Moment and what we're what we're doing here. So, uh, you know, fundamentally, I'm a, a wayward engineer, if you will. Uh, started off with a computer science degree and worked in the software industry for for several years, um, and then over time, um, I got involved in the. Uh, recruiting side of the the uh, the industry so I was in the Austin startup scene for for many many years you know 15 20 years um, you know primarily doing a uh, recruiting role um, but despite all that uh, I was uh, I've been a passionate car guy from birth um, literally just you know my first word uh, something that I've always uh, enjoyed and loved and uh, was very very uh, passionate about um, but it was something that I did you know purely as a hobby so uh, while I was you know working the tech industry I would you know uh, save up money and buy cars and restore cars or build hot rods or what have you uh, in the garage um, and back in 2016 I got the, you know, the, uh, the overwhelming desire to kind of reboot my life a little bit and do something that uh, I could truly be, uh, I could uh, enjoy truly and deeply. Um, and that's where I uh, came up with the idea of, of starting uh, Moment Motor Company. And fundamentally, uh, what we do is we convert classic cars into electric vehicles. Um, and I think it's critical to you know to point out that we're talking about classics here, not just not just transportation. Um, I think the the world has solved the you know uh, the electric transportation problem. If you're somebody who uh, wants an extremely uh, luxurious and fancy uh, electric car to drive to work, you know Tesla's got you, Lucid's got you, you know uh, Porsche has you. Um, but if you just want affordable transportation, um, you know, a used leaf can cost you five grand. So uh, really this industry, I think, has made a transformation from its um, infancy when it was all about, you know, taking a, a Geo Metro and sticking a forklift motor in it and, you know, screwing big oil uh, and driving to, driving to work uh, every couple of days. Uh, we're now at the point where that really doesn't make sense anymore. The accessibility of electric vehicles is pretty far and wide. And the conversion from a cost perspective and from the end result really only seems to make sense when, you know, for people who really uh, care about um, the aesthetic and the feel of, of the vehicle that they drive on, on a daily basis. Uh, and I feel like classic cars are uh, something that, um, driving them is, is like no other experience. And that's something that's important to Moment is that we are, we're really trying to preserve the cars as well as the driving experience of driving, you know, a classic uh, car. If you've ever owned one, um, it's, a, it's truly an amazing experience. I mean, you know, looking over the hood of a Porsche or, uh, you know, uh, out the window of an of a, of a Alfa Romeo, a, with your hands on the wheels, the smell of the leather. It's just a, a truly engaging and enjoyable experience. Uh, you know, when you park the car in a sea of, you know, Honda Accords and Camrys in the, you know, in the parking lot and you can, you know, kind of look back and see that, you know, the chrome and the, and the beauty of the, of the, these art, you know, these pieces of art, that's something that uh, is a unique experience. And, I really also think that it that the experience transcends just your relationship with the car. You 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 learn this when you drive them. You're in, 
inherently engaging with the public around you. People see these cars, they just, they gape, they, they shout, they love them, they wave you down, they tell you the stories about their uncle who had one or the one that they drove in college. And uh, there's just a, a, an immense amount of uh, engagement that you get from, uh, from these vehicles. And I've loved that my whole life driving classic cars. It's been a, a part of my childhood and a part of my, uh, my, uh, my life throughout. And uh, I, I wanted more people to experience this. These, these are works of art. Um, because the downside, unfortunately, of owning a, a classic car is essentially that uh, you're, you know, never far from being on the side of the road uh, <laughs> waiting for a tow truck. It's uh, it, it, the, the experience of, of maintaining a 50, 60 year old uh, internal combustion drivetrain is one of constant anxiety. You are always wondering what that smell is or what that sound is and whether or not uh, you're going to make it to the, to the next stoplight. And so we at moment are intending to kind of bring the advanced technology and the um, uh, maintainability and the uh, power and seamlessness that, that electric propulsion provides, but marrying that with these beautiful uh, works of art. So that's essentially what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, the next thing I kind of wanted to give you a, an overview of before we started taking a tour was the state of this this industry. Um, I think that um, if you if you've ever looked into the notion of uh, of converting um, a car, uh, there are a variety of ways you can go. And on you know on one end there are companies that will sell you the parts, the pieces, uh, the uh, the motors, the inverters, the batteries, and uh, and they'll let you kind of do it yourself in in your in your garage. Um, there's kind of been an evolution of that as well, where people are trying to create plug and play uh, drivetrain units that can be that can be put in a, a, a classic car uh, and make the um, the conversion process simpler and and, uh, and easier. Um, you might have read about things like e-crate motors and uh, you know really kind of uh, things that you could you know, that you could essentially buy and, and you know, drop in to, to any car. There's a vision there that, that some companies are trying to execute on. And then at the furthest extreme, uh, there are a set of companies that are specializing in some very particular cars and trying to build a true end-to-end -end turnkey solution where um, they restore the car and provide essentially a, a brand new you know, version of that classic uh, with an electric drivetrain uh, installed and uh, and deliver it to the customer as if it were a new purchase. Um, Moment is really kind of in the middle there. We uh, are, our purpose is to deliver complete conversions uh, to our customer's hands so they can just get in and drive of almost any vehicle. And we built our architecture and uh, the components that we use, um, uh, and I'll, we'll, that we'll go look at in the in the garage, with the uh, goal of being able to apply them to as many chassis and as, and as many um, uh, uh, vehicle platforms as as possible, um, so that uh, when somebody came to us and said, "Oh, my dream car is a 1976." you know, Datsun, then we can, you know, more readily take our, our components and deliver to them the dream car that they've always wanted uh, with an electric drivetrain. Um, so the, what that has produced on our end is a set of modular components that we reuse over and over again within our, within our builds. Uh, to give us the maintainability the, and the um, uh, and the uh, safety of, of uh, the, the repetition and, and the reuse, but also the adaptability. So we build them modularly so that they will they will fit, and they will uh, give us the most flexibility when we're trying to fit them into different shape vehicles, different drivetrains, and different chassis. Um, so that's 
generally the uh, the uh, the overview. Uh, I'll take any questions if anybody has it, and then really I want to just go out in the shop and show you all of this and give you a better idea of how that comes together. What do you think, Aaron? Any questions? Well, I had a question, um, and I was curious as to from the, kind of the start of, of your conversation with a client to, to the, the car rolling out the door, what, how long do you feel like that typically takes for you guys? That depends. So um, it depends on if it's a car we've done before, right? So yeah. if it's a car we've done before, we are, you know, every part that we develop, this is not a, this isn't kind of a custom fabrication shop where we, you know, hand make, you know, the parts and try to make things work. Uh, we develop all this stuff in, in CAD and, and every part that we are manufacturing or, or installing on a car uh, you know, is in is in CAD and is repeatable. And so, once we've done the engineering work um, to to you know to 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 fit these components within an, within a car, that drastically reduces the amount of time and uh, and energy uh, required to convert a car. Um, so we're seeing that uh, play out as we do you know cars that are. Um, you know that are that are ones that we've done before the range is probably for for a vehicle we haven't done before it might take 500 600 hours worth of labor um but for a car that we've done before it might be as low as two or three hundred hours and so um you know there's a huge benefit to that um you know this isn't you could talk about mythical man month and and so some of these things are not you know we, we aren't able to work eight hours a day, you know, uh, five days a week on, on, on an individual car and, and pop it out the other side. So if I were to put kind of general time frame, you know, car we've done before is something that, that we could do in a, in a, I don't know, three to four month time period, maybe five months depends. And then a car we haven't done before is probably more in that six to nine months um, as we spread it out uh, and, and do the engineering and, and then uh, have to wait for machine jobs and, and uh, uh, other fabricators to, to produce the parts. Are you primarily working with local fabricators or are you, are you outsourcing nationally? That is a, that's an excellent question. So um, we are, um, uh, we are very much interested in working with local providers. At the same time, there are some significant financial uh, impacts for doing that, especially when you're doing uh, rapid prototyping and trying to get something, you know, uh, quickly to test it and, and make that happen. And so locally, we work with um, water jetters and powder coaters, and um, we work with local shops that do, you know, suspension tuning and things like that. But the probably, you know, all the parts that we engineer that need to be um, uh, machined and manufactured, uh, we are working with some overseas shops to, to, to reduce that cost and, um, uh, and increase the, uh, the throughput. Um, we have worked with local shops and we do have some, some favorites that we'll turn to uh, when, the, when the need arises, but primarily we, we've, had to, we've had to put that um, offshore, if you will. We have one question in here about, um, so where do you source the vehicles? Do, does the owner typically come with it or are that's, they coming to you with a wish? That's a great question. When we started this, you know, so, you know, just the context, and I kind of let, you know, uh, gave you a little bit of this uh, taste of this when I was talking about what we do. Uh, I, I named the company Moment because I, I believe there's a, there's a moment when somebody becomes a car person, right? They, it might have happened when they were little and their parent would put them in the, you know, in the, in the backseat of uh, their prize, uh, you know, Mustang or, or what have them, have you, and drive you around the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the neighborhood on Sundays. Or, you know, for me, it would be, you know, tearing through car and driver and finding that picture of that Lamborghini and taping it to the, you know, to the, to my locker door. Uh, but I think the car people, there's moments for those car people and they it's very hard for me to tell you no your moment is going to be a Volkswagen bug or a <laughs> or what have you I want them to, to come to us with that dream car and say this is what I want um, and sometimes these people 
have have bought the car. They've they've loved it and they've cherished it for for its lifetime and are just sick of maintaining it and dealing with it. And they bring us the car and we and we convert it. Um, a lot of times, though, these are people who have always wanted one of these cars, and they finally have kind of the financial um, security to be able to, to purchase one. And uh, they've either held off because they know the maintenance, you know, potential, uh, you know, is, is, is high, and they might not be comfortable with that. Um, and, and so when we are available to them, they, it kind of is this magic experience for them. But a lot of times they haven't purchase the car and so uh, right you know right now I'm watching several auctions for cars that um, that customers have indicated that they want and we kind of help them find that car uh, help them pick out the, the best uh, car for conversion um, we know the things that are going to make our job harder and we know the things that are going to make it easier um, there's also some interesting aspects to this we could geek out about classic car things but um, there are more valuable versions of cars and less valuable versions of cars. A lot of the time it has to do with the drivetrain. And because we're tearing out the engine and, and, uh, and lots of, uh, lots of the, the drivetrain, um, a lot of times you can take the less desirable, less uh, expensive, um, lower end model, if you will, and, uh, and save some money on the initial purchase. And so we kind of guide them that way. Don't get a 911, get a 912. Don't get a, uh, you know, a 280 SL, get a 230 SL, right? There, there's a lot of choices that you can make that will allow you to do that. And we're there to help our customers do that. So if I were to give a, you know, it's probably 50 50 the number of cars that we have that are purchased and owned by the owner or that we help them okay that's great uh, so you just gave a couple of examples of, of some mm -hmm. of the cars i think but um sure do you have any others that you might want to mention as sweet spot kind of cars that are these are the easy I, ones just bring us i saw that question there. roll by that's a great it is a great question so i think the thing this is this is it's <laughs> and you can speak to this aaron uh I, th I think that there is a disconnect in our minds between um, uh, the potential, you know, w w what the efficiency of an old car is versus the, a modern car. And there is a desire to take the, you know, the large uh, flamboyant uh, tail finned, you know, cars of our, of our uh, past and to just say, oh, well, it's cool. I'll drop an electric motor in there and put in some batteries, and it'll be suddenly this amazing, you know, car that I'll drive, you know, with 200 mile range and everything will be great. And the reality is that these vehicles, the older they get, they were they were designed at the time of very cheap oil, and they are incredibly inefficient and and very heavy, not aerodynamic, and all things can be overcome, but there's a cost associated with it. So we tend to advise people to choose cars that are lightweight um, and, uh, uh, you know, tidy <laughs> from an exterior, you know, perspective. Um, I would say largely, you know, sports cars, usually import sports cars. Uh, if you're going to go domestic, some of the, you know, the smaller uh, domestics are, 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 are better uh, for that. Usually, I'd say no more than 3,000 or 3,500 pounds. Um, it's, 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 it's probably uh, wise. Um, uh, as far as layout and architecture, we've done front wheel drive cars, we've done rear wheel drive cars. Um, there's a variety of, uh, of approaches to take uh, depending, on the, depending on the chassis, but I would say you know the sweet spot where you really get a truly enjoyable vehicle is a lightweight sports car that you can kind of chuck around it, it really does transform the driving experience for those cars when you put an electric motor in them i think that's good i think uh, if you want to move on to the next section that'd be great right on. okay so what i'm going to do is uh i'm going to take you out to the shop and we're going to talk briefly about uh, the various components that we're using in, in these builds. We'll talk about some, kind of the, the pluses and minuses of, of, of doing the, these conversions in different ways. And, uh, and, we'll, uh, and then we'll look at some of the cars that we have here in various states of, of completion. And you can kind of see how that all applies. So I think the first thing to talk about, and I'm going to see if I can do this. Here we go. So we could talk here uh, about uh, motor systems first. So we are using um, 
typically three phase AC uh, motors in our in our builds. Uh, this is a motor that is from a company called um, NetGain. It's called the Hyper Nine, and it's a it's actually uh, not just a traditional um, three uh, AC motor. It is uh, actually what's known as a synchronous uh, permanent magnet reluctance motor, and so. Uh, it's this is technology that we could get into and, and, and discuss, but it uses um, instead of inducing magnetic fields in the in the uh, in the rotor, it actually has permanent magnets uh, in the rotor, um, which allow it to develop a lot more uh, torque and 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 be a lot more efficient than its its equivalent in the in a uh, typical. Um, induction AC motor. Uh, this motor right here, as you can see, you see my hand, it's about 14 inches long, nine inches wide. It's a pretty compact little motor and it makes about 175 foot pounds of torque, around 130, 140 horsepower. So this is a single motor and uh, we would use this in a, in a small car, be it, uh, uh, you know, a Volkswagen Bug, a, a little Porsche Speedster, uh, a BMW 2002, um, little Alfa Romeos, what have you. That's plenty of torque and horsepower to motivate those cars uh, along uh, quite nicely. Um, the notion of, uh, you know, the, the torque and the, and, the, uh, and the horsepower don't translate literally because the electric motor has a very, uh, has, has the, the benefits of instant uh, torque. So uh, these cars feel a lot more peppy when they have a, 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 a motor like this inside them. Uh, so what you'll see though is that it's not just the motor, there's, there's, there's a fair amount of uh, stuff bolted onto this motor. Uh, and this is kind of how this, this whole process works. Basically, this part here is what's known as the adapter. And so this adapts the motor to the transmission um, bell housing that we're, that we're, uh, uh, that we're mating to. So in this particular case, this is an Alfa Romeo uh, bell housing, and this bolt pattern is specific to the Alfa Romeo, and it fits right on there. The other thing that we would then put on is this uh, uh, flywheel coupler. This goes on to the drive shaft, and this pattern allows you to bolt the flywheel directly to that. And so when this is all done, this presents a, a face to the transmission that looks exactly like the engine would. And so when it gets bolted in to the car's uh, uh, engine bay, uh, all of a sudden the, you know, the, the, the car, the rest of the car doesn't, isn't any wiser. It has an electric motor attached to it. And uh, the other aspect to this is that, um, we have these side rails, you can see, they're in raw steel here, uh, but these are removable and changeable, and that allows us to have different um, motor mounts uh, based upon what the chassis is, is going into. So we can have uh, these rails with a set of mounts on them for a BMW or for a, an Alfa Romeo or for a Datsun or for a Porsche or for a Mercedes Benz or what have you. And it's just a simple way to swap these things in and out. Similarly, you can see this uh, adapter is bolts on to this uh, to this plate that we have, and that's swap outable. And and so I could take this motor and stick it in one car, or I could take it out, unbolt uh, the various components, and within an hour or two, bolt it into a different car. And so that's part of the modularity that we really try to build into our systems to let us um, to let us adapt to different cars. And this down here is something that we can kind of show you that gives you a little bit more of a of an idea. Um, of how we can we can take this modularity to the next step, right? Which is, this is a system with two of those motors. They are linked together with a belt system that we engineered with um, with uh, Continental, the the belt supplier, as well as there's an extra set of bearings in there. We worked with the the motor supplier to get all of the the um, the, um, the finite element analysis to work right and to make sure that this system would all work. But essentially, what we've done is we've doubled the uh, power and uh, output of this uh, of this motor. So now instead of 175 foot pounds of torque, we have 350 foot pounds of torque, and about uh, 260 270 horsepower. Um, again, you can see in the back of this one. This one has a has a different. Uh, adapter. This is for the BMW um, bell housing, and this is a, a clutch uh, and a flywheel for, for a BMW, and it will bolt right into the BMW uh, E9 that we're working on. So that 
part of the of the of our uh, of our approach is kind of really critical when we're trying to take these um, motors and adapt them to different vehicles it's it's really important to keep the dimensions as trim as as possible and to keep um, the uh, keep the systems as modular as possible I can swap these out everything is compatible between the two and it makes it very easy for us to take these and and, and adapt them to a new chassis I see a lot of questions going on so I'm going to just flip around and see if I can't answer some of those now and then we'll and then we'll move on to talk about batteries Mark I've been able to answer most of them I was okay I, good I was curious whether or not you um, you guys remove the fuel tanks and um, whether or not you try to fit battery in there that's a great question so one of the things that I think that is a little bit of a misnomer in this in this business, uh, you see a, a discussion of uh, you know the, the notion of an e crate motor where you get instead of a, a crate engine from you know General Motors or from Ford where you just you know you drop it in and now all of a sudden you've got a V8 uh, you know with some different motor mounts and and you're and you're good to go. Um, that's that approach seems logical and uh, and uh, compelling. Uh, the challenge is, as you, as you know, Aaron, the 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 space required <laughs> is not uh, is not the same, right? And specifically, when we start talking about batteries, right? So uh, it's one thing to say, "Wow, this is really cool. This is tiny," you know, compared to a to a, a combustion engine. Uh, great, just you know, throw it in there and then you know, uh, put some batteries around it. The challenge really comes down to the the size of the engine bay and how much uh, room there is left over to be able to put your batteries and your batteries are no longer the size you know it's not like you're replacing the engine with an electric motor and then you take out the gas tank and put bat you know batteries there you know battery pack will weigh 500 600 700 pounds and take up a lot more room than a than a than a gas tank will and so typically you have to put the you know the, the pack in different parts of the car um throughout the you know uh, uh, in the trunk and in the engine bay and balance it out um uh accurately and and uh um and appropriately for the for the chassis so that you get a you know a good handling result there were a bunch more questions that we have about, a, so we have another question about whether or not um or why use two motors bolted together versus a single large motor and then um, a, a follow-up to that is do you do four-wheel drive configurations that's a great those are both excellent questions so the there are larger single motors available uh, they carry with them a variety of uh, other requirements. Uh, a lot of times they will require um, higher voltage battery packs. A lot of times they will require um, <laughs> a lot more expense, let's just say that. They are extremely expensive typically. Uh, and so what our hope was with our architecture was to take, um, you know, multiple, uh, to, to allow for this modularity so we can say, it's the same system, it's the same components, it's the same approach, uh, regardless of whether or not we are uh, installing it in a tiny little uh, Porsche Speedster, or if we're putting it in a really, uh, you know, a larger, more, um, uh, uh, you know, larger, heavier, higher performance vehicle, like a muscle car or what have you. And this gives us that flexibility to say, okay, great. <laughs> Depending on the car, we have a solution for it. So you're seeing a single motor system uh, here when I flip it over and you're seeing a, you know, a dual stacked system right here. And actually in this Mercedes over here, and I can see if I can show it. The motors aren't in, but you can see the architecture. There's actually, this is dual inline, right? So we can put those motors in uh, a variety of different configurations and give us all the flexibility that we need to adapt to these, to these cars. Um, that doesn't mean we can't do larger motors, more expensive, different things. We, we, the architecture adapts to that as well. Uh, we just, we find that this gives us the most flexibility, so. Can I also add, I feel like this is an opportunity to point out that the company that makes the Hyper 9 has intentionally supported this market for quite some time. And, and yeah. it's really, it's, it's available and it's, it's, uh, they intended uh, for you to use it in the way that you're using it. So that right. they give you support for doing that. Well, and I'll, I'll, maybe I can geek out a little bit more on this. So there's a lot of questions typically about this. Why, 
do you 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 bolt up to the original transmission you know why do you do that that seems crazy i thought electric cars didn't have transmissions uh you know there's a lot of questions around why you know why take this approach and uh and what the alternatives are i think it's important to, to realize that in a commercial ev the architecture is very different from a from a traditional classic car uh, in a commercial EV, it's either front wheel drive or rear wheel drive or all wheel drive, but usually, uh, or actually 100% of the time, the electric motor is, is attached directly to the drive wheels, either to the wheel, to the, you know, to the axles directly, but most likely through a gear reduction unit and a differential, right? Uh, the Teslas do that in, you know, in the rear motor as well as in their front motor. Uh, the bolts, the leafs, the what have you, usually are all front wheel drive. But if you look at one of those motor, those motor, those drive units, they are a, a single, you know, they're a motor attached to a differential and and then directly to the to the to the drive wheels. Um, and when you do that, it allows you to do something that is unique, which is you can use an extremely high revving electric motor. A Tesla motor revs to almost 18,000 RPM. Um, typical, you know, bolts and leaves are 12,000, sometimes 14,000, what have you. So they're very, very high revving motors and they can take advantage of that because they are directly connected to that, to that uh, differential and, and very close to the wheels. You, what, what you can do at those speeds is you can make a gear set that essentially gives you a very very um, short gear ratio. So these ratio, these these motors are typically operating in the equivalent gear ratio of, of second gear for most cars. Usually a nine or, or ten ish to one, nine point seven three to one is, is very typical. Uh, and that means that the cars have tremendous torque off the line. They get because they're they're essentially you know ten to one reduction and you stomp on that motor and it just rockets you forward um, but those motors can also rev very high and so you basically get to stay in second gear throughout the, the you know the uh, the uh, the speed range of that of that vehicle and that's fantastic and it's amazing but it requires that architecture where you have the motors it basically in the same spot as the drive wheels and a lot of classic vehicles are not set up that way. They have a front engine and a rear wheel drive uh, architecture, uh, which means a spinning drive shaft, and you can't spin drive shafts at 18,000 RPM. So we, in order to kind of preserve the car and take advantage of the existing drivetrain without cutting up the entire rear of the car and building in and fabricating in all sorts of struts and bracing to put a, 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 a drive unit in the rear, we are taking advantage of what is ex you know existing there, and that means essentially just replacing the engine with the electric motor and leaving the rest of it somewhat intact. Um, this is a uh, this produces, in my opinion, a much more authentic driving experience. The the car doesn't turn into you know an electrified golf cart version of itself. Uh, it lets you drive it and engage with it the way it was originally intended and architected to. Um, and it's also simpler. The cars remain the what they were. So uh, you, you, you can take it to a mechanic and they know how to work on everything. It's just that everything forward of the transmission is, is a little bit different for them. So uh, there's a variety of different reasons why we do it, but, but it's, it has a lot to do with the legacy architecture of these, of these cars. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? There was one follow on to the related to the torque. Do you have uh, any issues with damaging drivetrains? Yes. So something that we are very uh, focused on is is trying to make sure that we aren't overpowering the car. Usually, we're able to provide a, tr a, a fair amount of you know more performance. Sometimes you know fifty percent, seventy five percent more, maybe even more, um, depending on uh, what the car can 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 handle. But uh, we we want to be respectful and careful of doing that in a in a in a vehicle where we can overwhelm it because not only can you break parts, but you can create a very dangerous uh, situation. And so uh, these motors, their, their output and their performance is all manageable and, um, uh, and customizable. And so we, once we have the drivetrain in place, we can dial it in to, uh, to, you know, to, to give the, um, uh, to give the owner uh, a, a feeling of safety and feeling like that they're not, you know, they're, they're not overwhelming the, the, the chassis.
So um, maybe you want to continue your tour a little bit, but sure. after you get a chance to do that, maybe you could talk a little bit about the challenges with um, automatic cars. And why you I just I, I just saw that fly by. I'll tell I'll just I'll briefly address that right, which is uh, an automatic transmission transmission is inherently an inefficient transmission. Uh, you've, the fluid clutches mean that you've got inherent losses just baked into it, so it's not a terribly wise choice from an efficiency standpoint. But more importantly, uh, an automatic transmission requires an idling engine to keep the fluid pressures up inside of it, and so it's just it's just fundamentally not very well compatible <laughs> with uh, electric drive. You can do it. You often use auxiliary pumps to keep the pressure up and then uh, and then you get the you know you get the function of, of that but typically what we will do instead of an automatic is because these electric motors do tend to have a more usable rpm range uh, you know they're they're not the motors that we're using here are typically rev to 8,000 rpm versus say 18 or, or 16,000 rpm so they're they're much closer to the typical um, internal combustion engine um, uh, RPM range uh, and thus are very compatible with the existing drivetrain. That said, not a lot of gas engines have that uh, have that range and none of the gas engines out there have the flat torque curve that, that, that these motors do. And so it does allow us to do something like, well, this won't be terribly exciting to look at, but that unit right there is actually a single um, single speed gear reduction unit and so with an automatic car where it doesn't it's not a stick car we can usually pick a, a, a rear end uh, differential ratio and match it up with a single speed reduction that will get us the you know to get us the performance um that we're that we're looking for um without requiring the the driver to shift this um mercedes actually is a, is a good example i showed you that dual inline um uh, motor that's underneath it and it is actually a direct drive so that is directly driving the um, uh, the drive shaft and that's because this car came with an unusually uh, uh, short rear end ratio so it gives us the flexibility to put two of those motors together with 350 foot pounds of torque you're you're able to drive this car with it directly connected to the differential and it will uh, it will perform very admirably and be uh, very, very uh, quick, especially in the highway uh, range. So shall I move on to batteries? Yes, please. Okay. So um, let me flip this around. So one of the things that we have a challenge uh, in this industry is that the best battery technology, sorry, I'm gonna put you down for two seconds. <laughs> the best battery technology that is available is not purchasable. It's, it is inside, oops, inside, there we go. It's inside commercial electric vehicles. In particular, this right here, what you're looking at is a Tesla Model S module. Um, so there in a, in a Model S, there are 16 of these modules in the floor and the big technological, uh, advancement that I think that, you know, that Tesla brought to bear is that they, they built their battery modules as, um, essentially ganged up, <laughs> uh, cylinder cells. Uh, so you can see, uh, this, the top here, you can see each one of these little dots is the top or the bottom, depending on where it is in the module, of uh, what's known as an 18650 cell, which is a very commonplace lithium uh, battery, um, uh, you know, uh, commoditized battery. These are made by Panasonic, but lots of other companies make them. And so Tesla's big, innova big innovation was to, is to gang these all up. They put 74 of them in these modules uh, in parallel, and that gives it higher capacity. And then those bricks of 74 are, are laid out in, um, in series to give you uh, nominally about 22 volts and uh, uh, and about 5.2 kilowatt hours out of this battery module. It's the highest energy density battery on the market right now. Um, and anything that we can purchase at this point kind of pales in comparison. And so uh, it's, so what we end up doing is getting these out of reclaimed um, Teslas and reusing them. So there's a kind of a nice little 
reuse aspect to it, which I like that these don't end up in a, in a, in a uh, landfill somewhere. Um, but uh, they're challenging, right? They are uh, not exactly, uh, you know, designed to just be thrown around. This is this, everything you see here that's silver is live. Uh, it is the part of the, 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 the bus bar essentially that, that, that uh, connects it. Uh, they are liquid cooled. I could show you the other end of them uh, and they need to be managed and taken care of. And so in order to do that, um, we, have to engineer a whole new way to uh, to enclose these batteries and so we have a modular battery box system that can do single modules dual modules this is a this is a triple module we have a we have fours we have fives and they're all based on the same architecture um, they're actually made out of aluminum that is not uh, we do not weld uh, we actually use an aircraft grade adhesive to, to glue them all together uh, and then uh, and then they get added screws to, to keep them uh, as rigid as possible and that makes them very dimensionally accurate and easier for us to, to manufacture and the flexibility of the different um, the different modules allows us to put them in uh, the different uh, parts of the car so uh, as we talked as we showed with this this mercedes there's actually two three modules in in this uh in this front um uh battery box and then there's another four modules that will go in the back here and so that kind of flexibility allows us uh to uh, uh to keep the weight distribution as uh as um uh, close to original as possible or as beneficial to the to the drivetrain as possible uh, and uh, lets us um, uh, not have to build entirely new battery enclosures on a per vehicle basis we can apply these uh, depending you know in different different um, uh, configurations depending on the on the vehicle so over here you'll see this uh, this Cobra replica and you'll see there's a two box up here and back in the back there's a, a five box that goes in the back where the gas tank used to be. Um, that's all over here. Um, and you can see in this car, same thing. We've got the, the dual motors stacked. Uh, so this is all the same kind of components coming together to produce an outrageously high performance uh, uh, little roadster here that we're really excited to get on the, on the road. Take the same components in a slightly different organization and you have a luxurious, uh, you know, Mercedes Cruiser uh, that is going to uh, be, a, you know, just an absolute joy to joy to drive anywhere. Um, you d drop down to a single motor. It's the same architecture under there, as you can tell. Uh, a three box in the in the rear and a two box in the front. And all of a sudden, we've got a, you know, a James Dean 550 Spider that's going to be an absolute screaming car because it weighs only about. 15 or 1600 pounds um, and then you can take you can kind of go an entirely different way and you can put the put together uh, you know a, a whole new electric DeLorean architecture here so uh, these are actually using different cells not Tesla's they're using LG chem cells so they have a, a different battery box but it's all the same architecture and we're able to take all of this and and kind of reuse it and and uh, and adapt it to the different um, architectures that are out there. Um, in the end though, this car actually is back in because we're putting um, uh, electric air conditioning in it, but it's a finished car. It's been on the road for a while. Um, you know, you can see our goal is to make these attractive and interesting with a kind of an automotive look to them. There's a battery box in the front. We, you know, nicely snake the, the, the wires to give it kind of a, uh, you know, uh, an intake uh, manifold type of look to it. Um, we really want to make sure that the customer is happy with it when it's all together and they can open up the hood and show it off and it doesn't look like a science experiment. <laughs> it looks like something that is, uh, you know, interesting, exciting and automotive. Um, you can see over here, same with this, uh, this little alpha, same thing, all the same um, components kind of coming together uh, in, the, in the same way. So I'll switch back and maybe take some more questions. We can look at any of these cars uh, in more detail if you'd like, but I wanted to kind of give you the overview first. So.
We had a question about whether or not you're personally on the prowl for the total Teslas or are you working with uh, suppliers? That's a, that's a great question. We, we decided to outsource that. We work with, uh, with some, some other people to do that. Uh, it's a big, it's a whole separate industry, right? And uh, I, I, we just, we can only do so much. So <laughs> no, we don't do that, but uh, we work closely with the folks who do. Did anybody else have any questions? We've gotten most of them. Oh, here we go. Oh, yes. Compatibility with J1772. Why, yes, they are. Absolutely. So uh, we can talk a little bit about that. I think that's an, uh, 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 you know, a bigger question here. So you can see right there, boom, boom all set. You know, typically we'll put it in the fuel filler. Uh, it makes, you know, kind of the most sense, uh, you know, there. We've done a few sneaky things before and hidden it in, in some interesting places, but that's, that's usually what we do. Um, so, uh, sorry. Let's see that. Is there another question there? It's related to whether or not the EVSEs are authenticating the vehicle, like a uh, charge point, et cetera. So oh, yeah, that's a good work, question. You, but, can, yeah. you can, yeah, they work, but they don't really know what it is. So uh, yes, that's a, that's a good question there. But right? um, well, and something that we get questions about often are, you know, hey, is fast charging available? Uh, you know, is this something that we can do? Uh, as you know, you know, Tesla supercharging stations are completely proprietary. Um, so we're not able to do that. Um, there is some, there are, there is some charge control software out there uh, that can handle Chatamo, um, and then uh, blanking on the other one, the CC. You you know better, Aaron. What's the what's the? Um, it's either CSS or CCS. I keep. Forgetting. Yeah. Right. And and so CCS. there, yeah. So there are there are are some fledgling uh, uh, electronics and, and software out there that are starting to be able to take advantage of that. One of the challenges we have is uh, these vehicles, it's, it, these are mostly we are not doing 400 volt systems. Um, the reasoning for that is it's actually very difficult to fit a 400 volt battery uh, a system in these cars. If you use, if you're using Tesla modules, you'd need to fit 16 of these of these guys in there, uh, and and that's just not possible. These cars are too small. There's just not enough there. There are other battery architectures available that can you can cobble them together and get them to, to 400 volts, uh, but it's it's not as repeatable or as easy to do that. And so when we're operating at these lower voltages, uh, there is support for that in some of these standards. Uh, for, for, you know, DC, DC charging, but it's not as, it's not as dramatic. Um, you know, typically my response to this is, uh, these are classic cars. These are meant to be kind of round town, uh, you know, enjoyment cars. They're, they're pleasure vehicles. Uh, they're not long haul road trippers. Um, and uh, it really isn't, you know, kind of the, the primary focus of, of, of the driver. Um, but uh, we would love to be able to offer it in the future if it, if it became uh, something that was, you know, readily uh, implementable. But uh, so we're on the, on the lookout for that, but it's not something that we're able to do typically right now. Okay, uh, I apologize for my dogs, <laughs> decided to go nuts. Um, however, the one question that came up is, what about the rules related to classic cars? Does it have to meet the current driving laws or the laws at the time it was built? That's an excellent question. So uh, the, the laws that are in place about um, safety uh, are, uh, are specific to the year that it was built. So these vehicles only have to um, adhere to those, um, to those uh, criteria. Um, when you replace the uh, drivetrain, it's a little bit of a gray area. They don't really, they don't, honestly, if the car is older than emissions standard testing, uh, they don't, it never has to go through that, um, 
through that uh, approval process. They, you know, we take these cars to the to the inspection station and they just check to make sure the, you know, signal lights work and the brake lights work and, and the car starts, you know, moves and stops. Uh, and it's pretty much done there. Um, in California, what's very interesting is the primary thing that they focus on when inspect if you have a, a car that is um, newer than you know and and is and is subjected is subject to uh, emissions testing, uh, but you've converted it, the primary thing that you have to prove to them is that there is no longer any fuel on board the vehicle. They kind of don't care what you've done to it as long as you can show them that there is no combustion power. That's 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 the goal there. Um, and so you basically get a. a an inspection that that you know certifies that the car has been modified as such, and then and then it continues on, uh, only having to kind of pass the safety inspections. So. All right, and we have a question about a specific um, car, a 1954 sure. Chevy, most likely an Impala. Sounds yeah. like a big piece of steel, right? Um, huge steering wheel. He's he's curious about whether or not you feel it might be a so it, it's back and we we kind of discussed this which is you know fundamentally anything's possible right we have the capacity that you know that dual motor system will move that car around just just as as fast if not uh, if not quicker than uh, than the original v8 that was in the car no issues there um but a vehicle that large um that you know that with zero aerodynamics is going to be an incredibly inefficient vehicle and so you're going to actually get you know probably do more like five four hundred five hundred watt hours per mile versus you know your typical ev in the 250 or 300 watt hours per mile um yeah so you know now if you want a hundred mile range you need to have a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack and you need to have room for that and there's a little bit of diminishing returns in in that and you might have enough room for a lot of batteries but adding a thousand pounds of batteries onto a you know four thousand pound car creates a five five thousand pound car and so uh you, you know the cost escalates as well as the um uh the uh, the performance requirements escalate and the uh, and the uh, this the battery pack size becomes larger and larger so you end up you know having to spend a lot of money and uh, uh, to, to produce a vehicle like that that uh, has usable range and and uh, is enjoyable but it's 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 all possible it's just how how big a check do you feel like you can write I think that's the last question. I'll, I'll, okay. Anybody else have any more? God. Sure. Contact info. Yeah, I happy to uh, send that out to you. Uh, we're if you want to very easily, uh, we're on uh, both Facebook and and Instagram primarily uh, as Moment Motors, um, and so uh, you can uh, follow us there and DM us there. If you're uh, if you're interested in, in connecting, you can also go to momentmotors.com and we have a little um, uh, contact page there that'll send us a, an email and get in touch. Um, again, my name is Mark Davis, um, and we have three people working here in the shop. My engineer works remotely, um, and uh, we're actually going to be expanding into the next bay in the next few months and uh, and bringing on some more people as business starts to grow. Um, uh, that's about it sure thank you thank you and, and i feel like that is a good uh spot to say thank you and to go ahead and close this out and i i do want to remind everybody that this is the second of a series of meetings that we're hosting related to the national drive electric week so if you want to see um, any of the other ones that we're doing later this week please go to austinev.org and uh, it's right there the post that shows um, what's planned. Um, and then that's also an opportunity to link to the Electric Auto Association, uh, where you can support Austin EV as your chapter if you like. So thank you for your time and uh, Great. talk to you later. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Take care. Bye.